So in the book, if I remember well, you make the distinction, clear distinction between consciousness and intelligence. And for some people that might sound a bit tricky because in some way we tend to think that there must be some kind of relationship between our ability to, to cognize and our awareness of it. So in what sense do you mean that they're independent? Well, I don't mean that. I don't say that they're completely independent. I say they're not the same thing. They're not okay. coextensive. And that's an important distinction because mm -hmm. intelligence is itself quite a vague uh, concept. You could say that anything that does anything has some minimal degree of intelligence. But the criteria by which we assess intelligence, very broadly doing the right thing at the right time, that's just a different set of criteria than the basic criteria of having experience. So for instance, a system that has the ability to experience pain or pleasure or suffering doesn't have to be particularly intelligent to have conscious experiences like that. Uh, and on the other hand, already we have artificial systems, which while they don't display the general intelligence of human beings, are still pretty smart. You know, we have AlphaGo and it's, it's children now that can do certain tasks very, very well indeed. But there's no reason to suppose there's any awareness or consciousness going on with that. And it is important to distinguish because it just gets at an assumption that at least some people seem to have, which is that if you just uh, make a system more intelligent, let's say a computer more intelligent, then at some point consciousness will come along from, for the ride, which is, I think, uh, an unjustified assumption. And on the other hand, if we're looking at the space of consciousness among non-human animals, it's misleading to use intelligence or human-like intelligence as a benchmark. Mm -hmm. I see. So for instance, uh, in the research that concerns animals, for instance, uh, ravens or crowns, that it's very popular that they, they, they try to assess how, how good these animals are in terms of decision making or, or cognitive abilities that might be related more to intelligence than consciousness. And the immediate inference that people make is that they must have had some sort of awareness due to the fact that they're able to solve problems. So in that sense, I want to make the distinction because the idea of awareness and the idea of intelligence usually go along when you try to prove other species that are not necessarily us. Yeah, that's right. And I, I, it's not that they're irrelevant because let's take this case of, of corvids as well. They're, they're extremely impressively smart creatures. Um, the question of whether they have conscious experiences is of course a difficult one to answer. And you have to, on the one hand, think about, okay, what, what's the brain basis of a potential conscious experience in a, in a bird? To what extent do they have analogous or homologous brain regions to the regions that we know are important in, in humans? And only, I think, then does evidence about their intelligence become useful in terms of inferring what their conscious experience might be like. So, for instance, a corvid that is able to cache food and sort of pay attention to whether it's being observed by another corvid or not, like I think some of these scrub jays can do. Um, this is super interesting and it's clearly a test of their cognitive ability. And if they do in fact have conscious experiences, it's really good information about what their conscious experiences might be like. It's a good indication that they have an experience of self as distinct from other, that they have some perception, some you know, conscious perception of other minds. But the fact that they do that is not in itself evidence that they are conscious. At least it's not sufficient evidence. You need to have something else beyond that. 